the bottom of it with your host, Joshua Moriarty. Hey, welcome back. Episode 47 of The Bottom of It. Getting closer and closer to 50 episodes. Really showing my commitment to the cause of bottomology. So many great guests I've had. It's been awesome. Really, really happy with uh, everyone who's been involved. Thank you, everybody, for taking part, sitting down and having a chat with me. It really, really means a lot. It's been very, very special. And also to all of you listeners, thank you very much for all your support. I get nice messages on Instagram and people telling me that they're enjoying it. So thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you all listening, being involved. really means a lot. Thanks a bunch. Um, What's going on, Moriarty Land? Well, just released my new record. It's called Romantica, and it's available all the places Music is in digital form, haven't done any hard copies, but you can get it. Bandcamp, Spotify, iTunes, all those places. Very chuffed to have it out doing its thing. Check it out, do me a favor, help pay for my lattes by contributing to my streaming royalties. I'd really appreciate it. I'll be putting some videos and a bunch of other stuff out over the coming months. Keep you posted on that, but it's good. Album number two by me, plenty more to come. Gonna keep keep going, keep doing it. All right, enough about me, Jesus Christ. Today's guest is Stella Mosgawa from Warpaint. Now Stella is a shithole tub thumper. Really love the way that she plays the drums. After the interview, actually, I went to the Warpaint show that night, and her feel was infectious. She's got the special juju on the drums. It was awesome. She's been playing with Warpaint for about 10 years, it seems. She also does a bunch of session work. She's played with, with four, Kurt Vile, Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth, the XX, uh, XX, the very... <laughs> It's very Kiwi, isn't it? And uh, Sir Tom Jones. He's a star of ever want. She's a leader. Love Tom Jones. Sir Tom Jones. Well, that's that's very impressive, Stella. Good shit. Uh, yes, yeah, so we had a good old bottom of it ramble. Stella came over to my place in Melbourne and we talked all things music, life, the usual bottom of it fair. We talk about the, logist- <laughs> the logistical difficulties of playing the drums and singing. Not the fact that it's technically hard to do the same thing at the time, more about the, the, the logistical difficulty. We talk about Linus Morissette, we talk about LA Rock Pigs, how necessity is a good motivator as an artist, how to make a band work long term, all sorts of stuff. So anyway, enough from me, let's get into it. Stella Moscala, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy. Who still rocks the headset mic? Good Live. question. Tom Larkin from She Hard always had one. That's really? That's the only thing that I Really? Was yeah. he the drummer? Yeah. Okay. He's the drummer. I would say like a Tommy Lee situation. Yeah. Um, are we talking just drummers or just people in general? I'm thinking drummers now just because that seems the most fitting. Okay. I'm going to say um, a Tommy Lee, uh, a Madonna. who's not a drummer at all. No. She's not a great drummer. Do you sing and play the drums at the same time? I do. Do you contribute to the BV I do a little bit. Like there's certain songs that um, need a little extra of Mm. that, but we all sing. It's very gang vocal a lot. It's very gang vocally, so I don't think it's really necessary. Like if I'm doing something more involved, I'll rarely, um, I'll very rarely like need to or want to sing. And it's always a bit, uh, it's a bit of like a, an IQ test to get the right microphone at the right angle, so you don't. Yeah, it's hit not the difficult pad. to actually play the drum and sing the thing at the same time. It's actually just to get the microphone. Just <laughs> the, the logistics the right. of the That's microphone the to the mouth, part, yeah, and kind of having it further away, and then choosing a moment while you're playing to, to have swing to it in and swing it in towards the mouth. That's ready a thing to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's the biggest issue. Other than that, I do it more often. It's just it kind of gets in the way. The cool thing. About oh, the Taylor head- Hawkins, I think, does a maybe. He doesn't have the headset on, does he? Are you sure? He's kind of daggy. I feel like he ha- yeah, I feel like he has I at least. Wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. If we he should, should do look that. it up. Maybe when he was playing with um, Alanis Morissette or something. Sure. Did he actually play with her for real or just on a record? He, uh, strangely, I know so much about this because one of the first shows I ever went to was Alanis Morissette at the right. Sydney Entertainment Centre. Yes. When, when I was this, Yeah, I remember that too because uh, yep. she came to Wellington when I was there mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Is that where you're from? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the moment. She was, the was record huge. was out. It was huge. We were all into it. The pill, mm. as I call it. Mm-hmm. No, that was 
Yeah, that was one. I think I'd seen Janet Jackson oh, before around that. the same time. Same time, it was the Janet album. And then I saw Michael Jackson at the cricket grounds in Sydney. Right. And all around like 10 and 11, I saw Janet, Michael and Alanis. Wow. Like in a space of a year or two. When you're a kid, you see pop acts, don't you? You don't go and see something cool, yeah. really. I think Alanis was pretty cool, though. She was kind of crossover. She, crossover yeah, that you is know? true. She was like rock, what would her, 90s rock light. What would know? her equivalent be right now, do you That's think? That's a really good question. I'm going to say... kind of cool, but also... Billie Eilish or something. Sure. Because she's yeah. cool, right? I don't know enough about her no, and her either. music to know but what she's she edgy. does. Sure. And she's really mm-hmm. popular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's I could see that. Over, I guess. Mm-hmm. Who else does it? Maybe someone like a Casey Musgraves. Which one's her? Who's I don't that? know. She's just a name I hear all the time. People yeah. like her and like the NPR crowd loves her and like I no. guess Pitchfork loves her. Yes. But then also she's like a country, kind of pop country singer mm. kind of thing. But it's a good question. Anyway, Taylor Hawkins was playing that show. Yes. And also um, the guy who, um, he was in the Red Hot Chili Peppers for like three days. And his name was Jesse something. He ended up marrying Angie Hart from Frente. Okay. And he was the guitar player. Like after and Chris Cheney, who later yeah. joined Jane's Addiction, was playing bass. That was her band okay. for that tour. Yeah. And Taylor was definitely like in the band. The LA Rock Pigs. Yeah. Guns. LA RPs, as yeah. I like to call them. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have mid- many um, interactions with the LA Rock Pigs living in LA? Yeah, sometimes. It's kind of like there's less of a line drawn between those people mm-hmm. in LA. I think Definitely. there's a lot less snobbery over there, which I think you probably, I'm, I'm sure you realized you yeah. felt that, you know, there's less of a cynicism. Mm-hmm. So if you just it's meet someone, it's very supportive. It's very generous. The spirit of that city, like the musical spirit of that city and just the way that people kind of, people share their resources over yeah. there as opposed to keeping their cards close to their chest, which I think is what happens Maybe a little more in Australia. I completely agree. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I just had that experience at least when I was growing up here and starting to play music. I, I had it when I was, like, I was growing up here. I'm wondering mm. if it's still here or maybe now. Everything seems a lot more open yeah, everywhere. I think you know? it might have changed a little bit. Yeah, but it was like that for sure. And I think a lot of bands and artists are going to New York and going to London and like spending time in LA and places like that and kind of realizing like. Just different ways of doing things. Yeah. But um, in answer to your question, um, LA Rock Pigs. Yes, I've definitely had experiences with the LARPs. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not as like, I don't know how to describe it. I would say it's, yeah, there's less of that kind of snobbery or less of an onus placed on what band people are in. It's like that person is just like a really great, musician and a really good hang mm. and it doesn't really matter that they play in maroon five or yeah, you know sure. taylor swift's band or whatever they can everyone and, just kind of gets along and with maroon their, five guys always kidding about the guitar player dude What's yeah i don't know him but i know that he plays with a lot of friends yeah. of mine and he's always like at the satellite in silver lake yeah he's james always valentine i think his name is maybe yeah, yeah. but yeah it's again like there's no like oh well we can't hire that guy because it's a bad look it's just everyone's just making yeah. music, you know, people just make different decisions. If you're doing it for the right reasons and you're good at what you do and you're a good hang, it doesn't mm. really What are the matter. right reasons, do you think? Hmm. I think just doing it f- for just having integrity and doing music, making music for the sake of making music and creating something that you're proud of as opposed mm. to you know, I want to get famous or I want some level of notoriety, a specific brand of notoriety and I want a specific amount of money and, you know. It seems funny to me to think that people could go into the music industry thinking that it's going to get them famous and they're going to make money. Oh my God, so (laughs) many people think that though. You've got to be mental. I I meet a lot of... um, They don't know. No. They figure it out But they see it with, you know, maybe friends of theirs 
that they're like tangentially kind of connected to yeah, sure. will like blow up on SoundCloud or whatever. I'm just talking about like younger. This is what people kind of expect to happen a little bit now though is that if you if yes. it doesn't happen within a year of you putting out two or three singles then then there's what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. And that's <laughs> yeah. great because that then that just like cuts the fat a little bit sure, and there's yeah, less people doing it for I mean, I, I'm sounding judgmental. This is just no, what I feel. Okay. I feel like that's what I described as being the right reasons. It's just what I believe to be mm. the right reasons to make music as opposed to that being like an absolute thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, there's a lot of kids, not kids, Jesus, that's another really condescending word, but <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> of the younger bit, generation yeah. of musicians that I've kind of come into contact with who... Um, for whatever reason, like I get an email from someone or it's someone's friend or someone's kid or brother or whatever and they're like, well, can you answer these questions? Like what's what's the best avenue for releasing my music and what do you think about this and metrics and that whole world is just so foreign to me. Yeah. But a lot of people do get trapped in that, especially now because there are so many examples of making it or being successful through so many different avenues mm. that it's kind of confusing. Whereas, I mean, back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, you just got a record deal and went on tour. And there was no real, there weren't like a million back doors. You no, know? no, of course not. I guess it was just getting the guy from the label to your gig to like you. And that was really it, wasn't yeah. it? You go to the showcase or you play South By or CMJ or something. Yeah. And then you're cool. It would have been kind of annoying though, always having to get the guy from the label to like you, wouldn't it? Totally. To suck up and to that's them. what's exciting. I mean, I'm very excited about the fact that there's so many different ways to do it. Yeah. There's many ways to skin a cat, as yes. it were. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm just like, I've, when people who are younger than me who are trying to get into music or. Um, playing shows and recording and and kind of starting that journey mm. or asking me questions like I just don't really even understand half of the terminology. You know? What advice do you give them then? Honestly, all I know how to do is just just work hard. Yeah, get just really good hard. at the thing that you do. Right, that's yeah. probably the most important. I of think all that's of crucial. Them. Yeah, um, I think that's what Jerry Seinfeld said. Was just make mm. sure your act is really, really great. Yeah, because. Honestly, you can't really tell when you're going to get the opportunity to, I don't know, showcase something to someone who's going to maybe change your life, you yeah. know, or be find yourself in a situation where um, you have to put your best foot forward. And at that point, if you're not prepared and you're not confident enough to uh, spread your wings, then that's an opportunity lost. Yeah. And also just... Yeah, get good at the craft of if someone's a songwriter, like just write songs all the time, mm -hmm. you know. It's not like never just waiting for the inspiration or whatever. And that stuff always rises to the top, mm -hmm. you I know. I agree. Yeah, it's a funny one. Uh, weed smoking inspiration, I've noticed. Like, yeah, yeah. we've got to get some inspiration, guys. We've got to smoke yeah, some yeah, weed. Yeah. Like, I mm -hmm. don't know if that would necessarily work. Yeah, how does that... Does that fit into your creative no, um, nothing. ceremony at all? No, no, no not at all. Yeah. There's been times when I've been in bands when we'll get stoned or whatever, but um, you know, it's, it's never, nothing's ever got in the way or changed anything for me, no matter what. Mm. It's always just keeps flowing through me anyway. Great. So I guess the best mm -hmm. thing is being, being more sober and clean and then it's just easier to get more work done. There's less obstacles yeah. physiologically and mentally. Yeah, like, totally. Yeah. I feel the same way as well. I, I was curious whether you, when you have smoked weed or done something like to alter your consciousness or whatever, do you usually do it or like bands that you've been in, is it usually in the process of creating or is it sometimes... When you're listening to something. I think I like it more listening personally. Mm -hmm. Like if the... Same. Yeah, if the mixes can pass the stone test, mm -hmm. that's some neck level shit. That means totally. you're, you're nailing it. You're yeah. fine. Because mm -hmm. you do, you do, I get way more critical when I'm stoned as well. Yep. Yeah. And you also like really ride the wave of joy. Yeah, You've done yeah, something good. Yeah, it's totally. Like, Whoa, truly. Yeah. Everything's enhanced. 
yeah, yeah. we finished our new record recently and mm-hmm. then we were driving back from Sydney and we listened mm-hmm. to it and we got stoned. I was like, Great. We fucking nailed it, yeah. boys. We did it. Good. <laughs> yeah. I think that's my favourite. If I'm going to do it, that's the favourite moment, mm. you know. still obsessively learning drum stuff music stuff no music stuff yeah i feel like i'm music stuff music stuff (laughs) um i'm not a huge i i guess i play drums a lot Mm. so i'm less inclined to sit and practice things unless i want there's something that um yeah obstacle i want to overcome or whatever like oh i but i don't really I'm not as much of a technical musician as I guess I wanted to be when I was younger, when I was first starting out. That was very important to me, you know? Yeah, I think it is maybe when you're a bit younger, isn't it? This yeah, you want to be industrious. You want to yeah. nail things. You want to... It must be quite fun know. now with all of the YouTube tutorials and everything. It's you could so totally, easy. Yeah. I do a lot more like um, I'm kind of teaching myself music theory because it's that's a bit of a gap in my learning and I do want to I've just found when I'm even just playing for myself or composing music I'll get I'll always get locked into these patterns Mm -hmm. that I do want to hopefully transcend at some point so just learning like I'll go on and just type in something dorky like learning five new jazz chords or intervals that I'm not really used to and then That's from that kind of thing to do yeah. yeah and even if you use yeah. two of them and that yeah gives even if you it's in two song, years time when you use them again you're like oh you that was the thing that, that i learned yeah. yeah so that kind of stuff i do it i'm not i'm not like super studious or as much as i'd like to be but i'll always i guess my problem with that is that i'll always do kind of practical work as opposed to sitting it's only when i have time to sit and learn something new that I'll do it. I'll always find an excuse to just like edit a song or edit a jam or something like that or mix something and actually do do something practical. What are you, Logic, Ableton? I do all three. Right. Tools as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right on. Right now I'm doing a lot of Ableton because I just learned how to use it about a year and a half ago. You're enjoying it? I love it. It's pretty fun. I love it, it so much. Do you yeah. use it? Yeah, that's all mm-hmm. I've used. It's been mm-hmm. maybe 10 years or something, yep. I think. Yeah. I'm definitely not a whiz, but I can get by. Yeah, um, I wouldn't call myself a whiz either. Right. I mean, you just use stuff like that as much as you need to. You yeah. know, like you only get as, it's such a deep program. You know, I haven't even started like the Max for live oh, no, stuff or any of that. Like I don't really understand that or like coding <laughs> yeah. and programming new plugins or things like that. That's a little out of my wheelhouse, but I think it's like I get in, I put in what I want to get out yeah. of it, you know, and it, and it's, it's a really, I think it works better with my, the way that my brain is structured and the way that I structure music internally. That's, it's more reflected, it's better reflected in Ableton than any of the others because I think mm-hmm. Logic and Pro Tools are similar. But I want to be like, I've they just kind of... They don't have as many fun colours as well. Which one? They don't have as many fun no, colours as Ableton does. It's so fun. The sampler is awesome. Mm-hmm. It's really good for... Um, yeah, it's just very like, it's an instrument more than the other two are. There are know? a lot of people who are yeah playing the computer now. Mm-hmm. Eh? That's their... Yeah, like yeah. Tim Scheel, who I just did... That Double J interview with, yes. he's a Melbourne guy. He was playing with Gautier for a few right. years. And I asked him, or my bandmate was like, oh, what did you play in his band? And he said, Ableton. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly like you can really yeah, be... Yeah, it's the new instrument. Totally. And it's amazing and it's really, really fun. I know a lot of people, they get a little frustrated with it if they're used to using Logic and Pro Tools. Mm-hmm. 
but I think it's something that every musician would benefit from kind of yeah. dipping their toes into that world and seeing what happens. Mm. Mm. I think a lot of you sort of, I've noticed people avoid it if they can, like, as long as they can get away with it and then eventually, finally. They cave. Yeah, there's no one mm -hmm. in their band or they're not dating mm -hmm. someone who can do it better than them or whatever, totally. whatever the situation yeah. is. Well, that's been the situation with learning, apart from Ableton, which I really just wanted to do anyway. The other two I learned out of necessity because yeah. someone in the band needed to do it and I had done it with different projects before, so at least I knew how to operate and kind of capture a performance or a jam or something like mm. that. Started there and then it was, well, we don't want to go into the studio with someone else or that the producer's kind of done with the record and we still need to do a couple of changes yeah, we so we get into involved. a studio and I end up engineering something on Right, so that's kind of your job in the band. I would say more, yeah. Um, well, a lot of the, this, yeah. quite a bit of program drum stuff, or mm -hmm. is it just it's not just the SPD kind of thing? I do well a little bit on. of SPD, SPDS, like live stuff over the top of either live drums or yeah. um, program drums. But Teresa is very um, into programming right, as well. Okay. So um, her and I are kind of capable of doing demos, like pretty, and I mean the other two as well. Emily yeah. and Jen, but I think they just don't like engineering as much. They're more Fair enough. kind of they do they they deal with it as much as is necessary. But mm -hmm. I actually get quite a thrill out of it, and I like doing that stuff. I like engineering and producing stuff, and I'll happily do it. Is that know. somewhere you sort of think you'll head more and more as the years go by? Definitely, yeah. yeah. Every time I've done something like that, whether it's um, just producing other people's music or remixing other artists. Right, okay. That, um, I like that muscle, I like building that muscle a lot. I find it really, I find it really creative and really exciting because it is like, I don't always, I'm not always thinking about drums and yeah. how I'm going to be a better drummer yeah, and stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I think it actually does, I, get that. I like that it, um, you know, when you learn another instrument, it just kind of, it helps you develop the way that you approach your main instrument in a way. And I feel like engineering and mixing and dealing with frequencies and all that kind of stuff is very, can be extremely creative and it engages a different part of your mind. And then you go back to your instrument and think, okay, well, what, if I'm doing this session for someone, what would I want me to do? Mm -hmm. If I were the yes. engineer, I would just want like Not simplicity. Hit the symbol as hard. Exactly. Just simplicity, <laughs> nice tone. You know, like get enough, you know, the practicality of it, of like giving people the takes that they want and stuff and then having an experimental thing. But also just like I, I would love to be like, I guess, more than like an impressive drummer. I like to be like pretty um, utilitarian. Yeah, you know? yeah, I totally get it. You're doing quite a bit of session stuff, are you? Mm -hmm. The internet told me so. Wikipedia, the internet? Yeah. The band or yeah. the internet? No, <laughs> no, um, no. Mm. There was a pretty solid list of credits for the la over the last how many years. Right, yeah. Even well, Tom Jones. Yes, Tom Jones is very exciting. Um, yeah, that's, I've kind of always been that way. Yeah. I've been that way for a while. I've all, before I was in the band, this is the first kind of band band situation I've been in for more than, you know, a year or two. Yeah. Um, but I, when I was growing up and living in Sydney, I was always playing in like five to seven bands the same time mm. and that's just kind of the way you know like everyone kind of did that yeah, All, a lot was, of musicians did that there because was a period it was, there for sure mm -hmm. when you're younger and you can actually if you go can just do it you go to troy, like that, yeah you go to troy horse like the the one like you know central rehearsal space where you see everyone and oh, is that someone the one in sydney is yeah bakehouse yeah. kind of here isn't i don't it? think it exists anymore sadly is it bakehouse here in that's melbourne? the one in melbourne yeah mm -hmm. sure. you bump into everyone you yeah. know yeah, and then you see you know someone's like oh so and so's left that person's band do you want to fill in for yeah. a tour or <laughs> yeah that kind of stuff so i've always enjoyed that aspect of um you know making music mm. and getting involved in different so it's quite things. fun the, the challenge of it as well of yeah i like the stepping in to see if you can nail it Totally, Five, and eight. being like being able to read a room, not just musically, but you know, I enjoy other people's personalities and learning from, you know, seeing how other people do a certain thing, how mm. other people like produce their music, how they um, 
how they engage with their own creativity and like how they craft a song. It's so different from ev- like every single thing I do and every universe I get to kind of step into is so is such like a enlightening experience for mm. me. I think LA is really good for teaching you that as well. Yeah, just being yeah. open and yeah, definitely. It's really nice now. I love. I mean. It's like being in a relationship. It's the longest relationship I've ever been in. Yeah, this the, band, the, the rock and roll sure. relationship. Absolutely. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. one for sure. And also specifically just like this band being in war paint. Yeah. It makes, it frames all the other stuff I do in such a gentle, lovely way as opposed to that just being my only job, which mm. it was for a while. It was just being a hired hand and just stepping in and out of those situations but never having a home. And it, I guess it is like that buying a house analogy versus renting, you know, like it's always a little bit stressful when you know that something has a shelf life and obviously wall paint can have a shelf life as well. But there is something that we, it's nice to approach other projects with the knowledge that you have somewhere to bring all your skills back to and kind of put your energy in and just like, it's the domestic space, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And you're all still tight as a gang and it's all it's so nice yeah i always really like hearing that bands are happy and that things are going well really happy now Mm. i think i don't think we've ever been i've never experienced us at a in a phase where it's really bad we've never had that but i guess like definitely miscommunications and misunderstandings and just growing together and growing up together yeah absolutely there's been issues for sure but I would say, I mean, I've just had a lot of experiences recently where I've had insight into other people's band situations um, that are similar to ours, like the similar kind of lineup or format. And it just makes me so grateful <laughs> that we really like each other, you know. And yeah, it can I get think pretty part toxic. of that hmm? can get pretty toxic. It can get toxic, especially if like resentment builds. And I think that's like any relationship, you know, if you're if you don't want to. Um, if you don't want to kind of like approach an issue head first or head on in the moment, it will stay in your body. It will stay in the relationship forever and it will just kind of calcify and it will turn into something so much more severe than it was the moment that someone talked over you or that they told you something that hurt your feelings Mm -hmm. instead of actually just opening the door to that issue I think the problem is people avoid that initial discomfort and don't talk about it because they just want to be cool and they want the other person to be cool and they don't want to breed any kind of discomfort in the moment and then later on it just turns into like that one it's a tumor that just just grows and grows (laughs) and then it explodes and it might be like the smallest thing that happened 10 years ago that just completely Mm -hmm. you know makes a whole like it makes the relationship implode are you having regular sit down band meetings talk throughs emotional get togethers all of it yeah talk throughs for sure but again like we just deal with things in the moment we don't do band meetings very well we're not great at that yeah but we're really good at being honest with each other and we're getting better which is why i think we get along yeah better than we ever have because there's just like a transparency in every relationship the collective relationship but all the individual relationships as well which are very complex two of the girls have known each other since they were 11 right grew up together you know they're basically sisters in a way Mm -hmm. and then they've known jen for lord like probably 20 years or something close to 20 years you know old gang so that's a lot of energy you know and that if if you don't care for that thing if you don't care for that little baby then it grows into a monster, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've seen different... You've been in different bands and different situations. Yeah, and, many iterations mm-hmm. of that over the years, definitely. And some you're just like, oh, I realise why that didn't work is because so-and-so dealt with things in this way and, you know... Yeah, I've seen all the crazy <laughs> shit happen over, <laughs> over the years. Yeah, I'm sure it's... I don't know how it's different with... Um, I've been in bands with men through the years but nothing this long standing so it's like I kind of I'm fascinated by the way that men deal with you know an all male band would deal with 
certain situations. Interesting. How the communication differs between like a group of women and a group of men. Yeah. I haven't really been in a band. Well, now I have a project with a good friend of mine. It's just her and I. Great. Yeah. That sounds perfect. Yeah, I think two pieces are. Yeah, it's, that's it's, the secret to success. Yeah. And I think because <laughs> we, we started it in the last sort of year or so, mm -hmm. and we've known each other for over 10 years and we've been close friends, mm -hmm. it's very respectful. Mm. So it's been quite easy. Mm. It's all That's like, a good I'm sorry one. if Bob heard that. No, no, I'm yeah. gay, Bob. It's been There's great. just no other energy that gets in to that little bubble. Yeah. And it's so much easier to just keep that, keep each side of the street clean mm -hmm. in that relationship, you know? Yeah. I guess we, it hasn't, um, we haven't been on the road and done too much yet, though. So, sure. so who knows where, what, yeah. what could potentially happen? Uh, it sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it sounds yeah, really yeah, positive. All right at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think also though, as you start the pro, you know, any project as you get older, you know what the boundaries are or how mm -hmm. deep into it you want to go. Totally. I think, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're way more capable and in control of your own destiny, at least. Yeah, and you might, you know, again, you're probably approaching it at a certain age. You approach those projects in such a different way than the band the first band you joined and you just like wanted to get signed and totally go on tour now it's like you know what i really like my domestic life and i like mm -hmm. not touring and i enjoy being in the studio so maybe m we're more of like a studio band and less of a live band or yeah you can kind of curate your happiness i guess mm -hmm. yeah definitely it's harder when the band's existed for 10 years and you're all a unit and you have to you can't curate your happiness quite as much can no, you No, it's not really up to you in that yeah. situation are you guys having to go out on the road to pay bills all the time is that a thing for go you? out on the road um no only in situations where i mean we've never done a tour just out of desperation but there's definitely been situations where i mean that is kind of the way that you make money for the most part yeah. being in a band like ours the revenue so the, the royalty stream thing coming in is not huge it's not amazing no, no. It's not really. so it's like record advances and live stuff um, we haven't released an album in a while yeah it's been quite a few years yeah. is it done it's ready to go is it's it not ready to go but it is getting done okay and it's very exciting who's working on it anyone working on it with right now you? it's just us just you guys okay mm -hmm. will you yep. get someone in do you think I think, yes, we're looking at someone um, who we've just recently worked with um, and we'll probably see how far we can go with on our own. Mm. And I've got a studio in Joshua Tree in my house. Sick. Yeah, it's cool. Oh, and so we've been working, way. we had like our kind of initial um, sessions there, mm. just kind of like opening up the, f the folder and listening to all the songs that everyone's been working on and then tracking over that and kind of slowly building what the album will be and what it will sound like. So we'll go as far as we can with that approach and then we've decided to kind of... There's re this, this one studio, another home studio that we really want to work out with someone that's a friend and... Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't name any names. I can, yeah. Um, I just, you know, we just never what really know what's going to happen. <laughs> it's this guy, it's a, he's a local guy. He lives in LA. His name is Lawrence Rothman. Okay. And we just did that. a, um, his wife uh, is an incredible director and she's just made a film and he was doing all the music for the film. So he had a bunch of bands come in and, right. and artists um, that he liked and he maybe worked with before to write a song specifically for this movie. And so we did one of those sessions and we all kind of just unanimously had such a nice time with him. Jen and I have actually worked with him before on his own project. Okay. And he's got an awesome um, studio in uh, kind of Runyon Canyon. Him and his brother work together a lot and he's just got great gear. It's such a nice, relaxed environment. And just the way his, his energy and his presence and the way that he... Um, the kind of constructive criticism mm. is just, I don't know, it resonates in a really nice way with all of our yes. kind of energy, our dominant energies, you know, and I could tell that everyone was really listening and respecting what he had to say. And that's something that's, I mean, that's the most important thing. You know, yeah, there's definitely. a lot of amazing engineers, there's a lot of amazing producers, but if you're kind of not, really if there's no mutual respect mm -hmm. then it's just kind of an impractical situation because that person is there to you know 
that person kind of demands respect in a way and is there to challenge your idea of what you're making, mm. you know, and if you don't respect their opinion and the way that they're communicating to you, then you're just going to shut down and you're going to do things your way and then you're just spending money for nothing, you know? Yeah, of course. So in this situation, I think we've, yeah, we'll, we'll, it looks like we'll probably get, you know, I don't know, 70, 75% of it done. We usually use a lot of demos that we've made. You guys, um, it sounds like you just jam a lot of things together. Like this. Yeah, a little bit. The last record, less so. And this one, we have to be like vigilant to actually get in the room and... and Hard to get everyone together. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I bet it is. And we get a lot done sometimes in pairs and yeah. just with three people or just like a multi-tracking situation. But I think we're going to really make a, um, a real effort this time to get in a room and, and make music because there's something very special that happens when we're just jamming. Yeah, know? definitely. Mm -hmm. I guess it is. It sort of moves in a particular way when everyone is contributing to, totally. to that. Yeah, and it, you kind of write songs in the moment as opposed to labouring over where should this song go. It just kind of naturally happens when you're playing yeah, together, you, you know. Yeah, you, you wouldn't... A bunch of the things you do jamming, you just would not do by yourself. You'd Ever. never write those chords or... Nope. Like, that's. Yeah, I know, no, it's, totally. it's funny like that. I, I think we're really... We benefit a lot from that that approach. And we didn't do that on our last album as much. And I think I, I at least can hear that. And I, I like a lot of the that's, stuff. Yeah, that's... Uh, War Paint's the one before it, isn't it? Yeah, that yeah. one was... We went out to Joshua Tree for a month. Yeah. And rented a house and built a little makeshift studio. That's and we favorite. wrote a lot That's of That's my the, favourite one. What? That's my favourite one. The makeshift studio? No, the oh. War Paint album. I think that it's was, mine too. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I mm -hmm. like the most. And so I think, I, just selfishly, I, I want to take that approach a little more. And mm. um, some of that the stuff is just kind of weirder and more natural and more us, you mm -hmm. know? Not to kind of... Um, not to uh, diss, you know, a baby, but no, that one I felt that that one's kind of the one for me when I listen back to it. I, I feel really proud of that record. Yeah, and it, is a, it is a funny situation that one, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Like, why why is that one not as good? Or I know I know exactly why. Yeah. It's not as good for me. Like my experience of making that the last record was like a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. but um, just like there's I learned a lot from that process and learnt the things that I wouldn't want to do again um, and was a crucial experience to lead us into making the, the record that we're making now, which yeah. I think is going to be really interesting. Well, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. I feel really positive about it and I'm usually like pretty neurotic with that stuff. You Are know? You, you optimistic in general in life? I think so. I think generally, yeah. But I'm also really hard on... I'm hard on myself and so mm. I'm hard on, by proxy, I'm hard on the band as well because that's a part of me and that relationship is so important to me and that, you know, I want to make it as good as it can be, mm. you know. Um, Outside of that, like into the world, do you, are, you, are you sort of optimistic in that we're going to make it through the tough times? I think so. Maybe it's naivety slightly. I mean, I know a lot of people, a lot of friends of mine who are kind of, um, I would describe it as dooming, you know, they're looking <laughs> at the world and thinking, you know, we should be angrier and we should be doing more and I totally do agree. But I have experienced, I found like a really nice, I guess, a balance of knowing enough to stay connected to what's happening in the world so you can, it's a motivator for doing good things, mm. you know, giving to charities or like supporting a particular cause or understanding politics in a way that you can actually discuss it and make some kind of change if that's what you're motivated to do. But also not burying myself in that mm -hmm. world because it can, you know, you're kind of, it will lead you to a pessimism that's really difficult to unlock yourself from. Yes. And I think you need a little bit of optimism and you hope is kind of the most important thing in the world. And I've felt, I know the feeling of feeling hopelessness and feeling like there's nothing you can do in a situation, both personally and globally. And so I think that a little bit of optimism is like very practical mm -hmm. in terms of changing the world because otherwise you're just paralysed by, you know... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, or you feel like pretty impotent, I think, 
when you do feel pessimistic and everything in my life has just felt a lot better and I've been able to do a lot more and stay active and engaged in the world when I am when I carry a little bit of hope. And that's a conscious me. decision to try and remain optimistic as well. I think it's like brain training. Getting so. brain training. <laughs> um, honestly I think it's maybe the knowledge of like the the alternative didn't work for me. Yeah, the sure. alternative of being anxious and being, you know, pessimistic and leading myself down that path wasn't didn't feel good and I didn't get anything done in yeah, that sure. phase, you know, and I didn't feel creative and you know. So I think it's just about knowing that like this is the better route for me. Mm. But I think in general I'm pretty I'm a pretty happy person. think sort of creating music fits in in terms of giving back to people or anything do you, do you feel like that you feel like you make a difference through creating being an artist yeah I think hugely um not that I feel like I contribute hugely but I think <laughs> no, I huge I, I agree like that's most of my that's the motivator for me mm. is when I was um before I moved to America after high school I went um I was going to be a social worker. I was okay. studying at Sydney Uni to be a social worker and that's kind of, I wanted to either be a psychologist, a counsellor or a social worker and that kind of in a way has a parallel to being a drummer. I know it sounds, that might sound arrogant but especially someone, I mean I get to just help a lot of people mm -hmm. finish their albums or add something to it that, you know, um, I don't know, is like, to me, feels beneficial, you know, trying to approach things without ego and just being there to help, you know, being the, being the, um, sometimes the last piece of a puzzle or just coming in and being positive about someone's music sometimes can really, can be a very helpful thing. And I know that people in my life have helped me with that as well. So that's kind of how I feel like for the most part, contribute to the world. And yeah. I don't know if it's important at all, but it feels very good. Mm. And I like being a small part of something that I think is special, you know, like an album that I think is meaningful and I think is um, uh, beautiful or deep, you know, just having some, being a small like cog in the wheel yeah. for me is like, that's very exciting. Is there anything you sort of want people to take away from the war paint records or anything? Is there like a message that you guys have? Anything that you... Hmm. I don't know about the records themselves. That's kind of... That's such a subjective experience. Sure, yeah. But I would say I've been thinking more and more lately that I guess the, exi the way that we exist as a band and the fact that we still exist as a band. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the takeaway is that... you you know, four very dominant energies, female energies can coexist in a right. creative environment and there is a way to do it and it's hard work and you will lose your mind, but it's possible. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there is a, it, it is a thing that can last, it has longevity, you know, you can maintain a sense of creativity and passion and fire for what you do in what can be a very trying situation sometimes, which is for people enacting And you think that there's a difference between male and female in those situations as I well? I don't really know because I don't know <laughs> the opposite. Yeah, I don't know yeah, what it's like to be a male musician. I Maybe we've seen it more. There's been more bands of men around. That oh, are, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. That, but. but I think, yeah, I mean, it's just weird for four people to stay together in any situation <laughs> yeah. for 15 years especially if they're all contributing to the creation as we well we all are yeah, yeah. but I, I like the um philosophy that we have which is you know 
we don't do like splits or anything. Like we don't sit and go like, oh, well, Emily wrote the no, chorus or whatever. No, you down there, all shared. Yeah. All, everyone shares and it, it's a huge... I think that's great. It's a huge relief for everybody. Yeah. Um, it just means that you kind of, you know, I'm very aware every time that we go into making a record of like, I want to contribute that 25% mm-hmm. or as much as I can possibly contribute. Cause I just, I don't want to be a passenger in this situation. Yes. What can I do to help? What can I do to like unpack a song and bring it to life and maybe like engineer Jen playing bass over Teresa's song that she's brought in a demo or whatever. Like that to me is like, I want to contribute as much doing that kind of stuff and helping to arrange songs and, and yeah, just give them like, bring them into the light yeah, of and also play the drums. Cause I'm generally not writing or composing the songs. There's been a few, I mean, I've done like guitar parts and synth parts and melodic stuff and written one song on the record before. But other than that, I'm the not. The drums are a big, very big part of your records as well, though. I mean, I was listening to them a right. lot. Right, so yeah. Like, they defi- helping really to define the songs as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Comes I mean, that way. yeah, it's, um, yeah, I just try. It's a really nice way to approach, I think, being in a band with four people. Mm. Um, so everyone, like, brings their A game and wants to be as supportive as possible because it's not like, well, if I'm not going to make any money from this song, I'm just not going <laughs> to contribute. Oh, it's like we kind of have to prove the resentment sometimes. as well that we're talking about. Huge. Yeah. And I know a lot of bands that do that and I think it really does. Um, yeah, it absolutely. It just fucks the vibe so hard, mm-hmm. you know. Can I say fuck? You can say whatever you Woo! want. Yeah, fuck, fuck yeah. off, you cunt. Fuck off, you <laughs> cunt. Um, yeah. I just, it really does damage the, a very delicate relationship, which mm. that's what it is, you know? Is there a song you never need to hear ever again? Of ours? No, of <laughs> anyone's. I really... What songs drive you mad? This one song and my old roommate and my best friend Andy always kind of terrorizes me with this song is Sultans of Swing by Dice. Oh, Strikes. yeah, okay. I I'm really starting it. to notice a trend here. No, Why? It drives me in the in like the guitar tone, the spirit of that song is like disgusting to me. Mm-hmm. I can't I don't I can't explain it. Okay, yeah, because mm-hmm. I asked um, Olivia Olympia that from the Olympia her group. She she said um, uh, American Pie, Bye Bye American Pie. And Don McLean. Yeah, and mm-hmm. then I said um, no, I, maybe I mentioned Hotel California, and okay. she's like basically called them the same song. And I think totally. Salt of the Swing sort of fits into the same it kind of realm. Does. It's like old bloke, guitar boring story <sighs> shit. Yeah, my friend, yeah, Aunt, the same friend just sent me like an Instagram of um, uh, Mark Knopfler doing uh, Money for Nothing at Live Aid with Sting. Right. And just watching that, I was just like, I just don't get that band at all. Mm-hmm. They're all fantastic musicians. Like, yeah, so technically it's not speaking, that hard to be that good at Mark music. Knopfler's like a great guitarist and. You know, I think maybe objectively he's written some great songs, but I just can't. There's something about the timbre of and the texture of mm-hmm. <laughs> every Dire Straits yeah. song that sends chills down my spine. I don't understand. I liked it when I was first learning guitar when I was mm. about 15 because mm-hmm. it was you could learn bits of it and you thought you were cool and you were achieving totally. something as a guitar player. But yeah. now listening to it as a guitar player, I'm like, yeah. What's your answer to that question? Um, mine was always. Eye of the Tiger <laughs> and, and Living on a Prayer. Is living my on pro- a Prayer. Yeah. I to- yeah. If they never that played Living on a Prayer again, you wouldn't fine. be up- upset. I'm going to say, you know what? The song, the modern song that really drives me up the wall, and I know that this is like a really big... Oh, wow. Well, this, this sounds oh, juicy. Please I know. I feel really bad. No, just say I'm it. I'm sure these are really nice people, and I don't hate all of their songs, but just the what this song represents... Yes. When I'm when I've been in any social situation or I'm at a bar and it gets played, it's usually in the UK, but it's happening a lot more uh, in LA now. Uh, is Mr. Brightside by the Killers? Oh yeah, and people lose their minds yeah, when they hear it. Maybe I that's going to be understand. the new living on a prayer. It kind of is becoming the new living on a prayer, isn't it? I think you've nailed it. Yeah, yeah it's real. It's so ubiquitous. Yeah, and it does something to like white people that is just like <laughs> kind of confounding to me. And whenever I see it, there's lots of memes about it at the moment, isn't there? There was one that made me laugh so hard. It was like, what happens when like yeah, with the beam of light coming out? Yes, of the, the insane Johnny one. It's so good. 
Yeah, that's spot on. It's just people just like, <laughs> they lose it. And I don't get it. I just, I guess I don't get it. I don't want to blag on. No, nah, no, nah, it's but... good. I, I feel like we need to start um, re-looking at some of the classics and the legends of rock and mm-hmm. music and everything and start to go, is it really that good? Bit, yeah, is it really mm-hmm. that good? Because we're just, the myth and the story just keeps mm. getting built up and it gets told over and over and over. And totally. Like we sort of forget, you, you, don't, you don't even see what it is anymore. It's mm-hmm. this weird Emperor's New Clothes thing that mm-hmm. happens. Fully. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went to see... Um, Bruce Springsteen play. Now, don't, he's got some great songs. Some love, I think he's amazing. Some, yeah, I, yep. I really enjoy mm-hmm. a bunch of his songs. But his live show, I lasted 20 minutes and then no I way. walked out. Yeah, it was Why? just... It was, uh, it was just like the, the fiddle player and everyone yeah, just going to yeah. the drummer. Max Weinberg was terrible. Yeah. He had no feel. And really? Yeah, I don't, I don't like Max ah. Weinberg. I don't know. Okay. I don't, yeah, just if there was this, I just thought... I don't feel like all of you people in this 50,000 seat <laughs> sta- stadium, because well, there's so many people at the gig. Where was, was, it, was it? Was it in LA? Uh, or no, was it was here. here. It was yeah. in, um, it was at one of the big Melbourne stadiums. Okay. But I feel like people stop listening. Fully. Yeah, and they're just seeing something, or it's like with the Rolling Stones, they'll go and mm-hmm. watch the Rolling Stones, and I don't think they're listening anymore. They just know they're seeing the Rolling Stones. Yeah, so they can't leave. Yeah, yeah. and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, oh, the Rolling Stones are great. And everyone goes, yeah, they're great. Like, mm-hmm. they don't sound very good, guys. They if sound you're terrible. To them, they sound really and bad. They look even worse. Yeah. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yes. I would go to see them. I've never, like, that's the thing. I've just never seen um, Springsteen or I've never seen the Stones right. or anything like that. Yeah. And I want to just, like, get a little taste of that before no, they I, die. I, I hear you. <laughs> they but all but it, die. Is, it is funny. We, we, I think we do need a, like, take the piss out of some more of the stuff and yeah like stop stop having so much reverence for everybody yeah and be able like you know you can't choose when if you want people to be authentic and honest you can't really like put a cap on what and when their honesty like when their honesty ends begins and ends you can't be like okay that but you can't make fun of the stones <laughs> and you can't make fun of paul mccartney no one's immune to criticism no one should ever be immune to criticism yeah. because that's how that's like you know it's like part of evolution you know mm-hmm. it's like a darwinian thing i guess like you have to kill some of that stuff oh you lose it as well if yeah. no one ever tells you no anymore you just they start going mental mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah it's a weird that that is a, something i think about a lot actually just the way that history frames and and transforms an artist mm-hmm. you know i think jen was it jen or em- no emily was watching something on the plane and i love bowie like don't get me wrong love him but she was watching this documentary i could be wrong about this but i think it's about the first 10 years of Bowie's career. Mm -hmm. So he made, like he was writing so much material for like a decade before Space Oddity. Maybe less time. This is her telling me the story, so I could just, could be like, both of us could be like truly wrong. But um, it was, yeah, just about how he kind of kept hammering it, you know, and he wasn't successful for those first few years but the way that we frame him as an artist is just like he was just a shooting star he just like he was like yeah, a yeah, meteor absolutely. that came to earth and just like instantly kind of made history but you know the the details of it sometimes are um omitted from like the cliff note story of yeah, david yeah. bowie which it's more interesting and rich and humanizes him to talk about all his failures as well. Yeah, that is, especially with him, yeah, it is like the man who fell to earth totally. It's not... Yeah, it's not like the first song that he wrote and put out was Space Oddity and it was like huge. It is very encouraging for anyone making albums or doing anything, seeing what what all these people did. I mean, even it's funny, the Bee Gees being a sort of pretty average folk band until they just yeah. became the kings of disco it's quite yeah. a, i think there's a whole bunch of folk records that are isn't there like a really someone played me a while ago a song and they were like guess who this band is and i i don't know i was like i don't know jefferson airplane or something they're like it's it's the Bee Gees, <laughs> and i had this rad like moog line right. it was like this kind of psychedelic synth mm. song didn't sound like them even singing it, but it was no. Nah, like they weren't singing in their, in their silly voices. Yeah, they're silly. <laughs> <laughs> I 
do love the Bee Gees, though. I do too. It's incredible. Um, uh, yeah, the more I hear them now, I have even more mm-hmm. reverence and respect yep. for them because the songwriting and everything about what they're doing is crazy. Amazing. Yeah. They were assassins, like musical assassins. Yeah. You know? It doesn't seem like there's as much musicality in pop music, I guess, or something like there was back then, huh? Like, yeah. I would agree with that, but I would also say with the um, kind of the disclaimer that I am getting older mm. and there's certain things that I know, like I just don't really maybe don't resonate with me the way that music resonated with me when I was younger. You yeah, know? sure. So, yeah, no, not to I say that know. modern music is bad or anything necessarily. I think it's just actually the sort of musicality that was yes. that existed with, you know, bands it was like in, the Beatles and yeah, the, yeah, the Carpenters yeah. and stuff. There was a lot of chord movements and Fully. a lot of, you studied. Stevie Wonder, all yeah, that kind yeah, of exactly. stuff. And that was like top ten yeah, music. yeah. Whereas in top ten music, you would, these days you wouldn't hear interesting chord changes. Honestly, or I just sometimes, sometimes I just love pop music. I just love pop music in general when it's done really well. Mm. Um, but there have definitely been times recently when I'm usually in an Uber or a Lyft. <laughs> yeah, because that's the only time. It's the only time to I really it, listen it? to like top forty you're not radio. At the club, top forty club. No, or anything, I'm not. No. Uh, but I do find myself in Ubers listening to, you know, it's where I've heard uh, Ed Sheeran's, you know. I'm in love with your body, whatever the hell that song is oh, called. Oh, yeah. Just heard it probably four million times in mm-hmm. an Uber. But sometimes I just feel like I'm taking crazy pills. When I'm, in a, when I'm listening to like the kind of production and stuff like that, it's just yeah. I'm not saying it's bad and I'm not saying I don't, um, like I'm not dissing it in any way. I'm not even just trying to be you super diss positive. It you diss it if you want. But it, I just don't understand it. And I think I have to be like, you know, you have to check yourself in moments like that and not say, well, this is just objectively bad. People enjoy it. There are kids who are really inspired by this music and it means a lot to them. It just doesn't connect with me in any way, you know. So I I don't know if that's a combination of, yeah, the lack of musicality and the lack of maybe care. Like the standards have lowered maybe ever so slightly when it comes to the kind of songwriting. It would have always been that there's... Through every generation and decade, there's been terrible pop music that Absolutely. has just filled the radio. Fully. Yeah, and then it just vanishes after now we don't remember mm-hmm. who any of it is because we only remember the good ones. Yes. So it will be the same for these I last I think it is all years. the same. I'm just in a different phase of my life and there's just moments where... Um, I mean, I love Katy Perry. Yeah. I think she's great. Yeah, some you know, of those whole, are great. That whole side of pop music is like really thrilling to me, but thrilling you know anyway i like it it's fun uh it is fun, love definitely. shania twain you know like shell crow oh, man though you're naming you know yeah they're my they're on my face the love Cheryl crow best, and shania twain. the best ladies yeah uh but i don't yeah i just really do sometimes listen to to music top 40 music now and i'm like i don't i don't even know what this is mm-hmm you know, it's really, it's kind of fun sometimes. I'm like, wow, I really feel so disconnected from pop culture. You yeah, know? I know exactly um, what you mean. But yeah, there's no real, there's no real point to that story. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? We're talking about the reverence. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh no, you said that there's, you find that there's less musicality in general. Yeah. In modern music. Mm-hmm. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. But then what's his name? And Max Martin will put a little bit in there every now and again, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, who's that? he working with now? I don't know, actually. Mm. Probably still everybody. Mm-hmm. But Was he like Taylor Swift? Was I've lost Taylor track Swifting? of Taylor Swift and Katy yeah. Perry. I yeah. don't know. They both started to scare me a little bit. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I when feel they, like Katy is... Um, maybe she's not... When she, when she got the short less, hair she, and she did the basketball video, yeah. she just looked oh, a bit silly. Oh, I love silly. that song. Right, that's Swish, Swish, Bish. Yeah. Is it a good song? I like okay, it. Okay, I gotta I like go it. back and re-listen because I, I liked that one. I just thought it was like I like that it was kind of like housey. Yeah. You know that that some producer was like, uh, I don't know who it is, but just the idea of them being like, well, house is back, nineties house it. is back. Yeah, Let's sure. do like a slightly worse version of nineties house music. I think I've got to listen to that album again. Um, it's pretty good. It's got another song that was pretty big on it. I can't remember what it was called, but there's like anyway. It's fine. I like that song, Birthday. Do you know that one by Birthday? Katie? Yeah. No. That's probably my favorite. Mm-hmm. Must be off the album before. 
check mm. it out if you get around to it. Okay, I will. Yeah, hey, that'll be plenty. my. We've got heaps of chat chat now. We, we can, cool, we can awesome. <laughs> that'll be my homework. Damn, Cheryl Crow, and Shania Twain, two of my favourites. Good, good, good reference, Stella. I'm, I'm very, very on board with that. It was wonderful to sit down and have a chat. I really enjoyed that. The wall paint show I saw was brilliant. It's such a unique band. It's such an original thing that happens when those four women get together. Very, very cool. My favorite wall paint album is the self-titled record released in 2013. Check it out. But all the records are good. Hey, you know, come on, get, get involved, everybody. Sounds like they'll have a new album out soon, which is exciting. Great they're still together and doing their thing. I really admire a band that can stay together and keep putting out good records. It feels like an anomaly these days. Most bands last a record or two, then crash and burn, so it's always special when they can work it out and stay potent. Full respect. Also, Stella has a monthly radio show on BBC Radio. I've included a link to that in the podcast description as well as a few other things. I've had a listen to a radio show and it's always very fresh. Get involved, people. All right, thanks so much for tuning in. Appreciate the support. Like I said, check out the new Joshua Moriarty album, Romantica. It's very easy listening. It's for while you're cooking, chilling, drinking wine or tea. You can have tea if you want. That's cool too. Lots of strings and sax and piano. I think you'll dig it. It's uh, it's jizz-free is the way I like to put it. I like to put it. it feels like a lot of music out there is always trying to jizz on you and I promise that that is not what I'm trying to do with this album okay all right thank you very much back in a few weeks take care until then see you later